If you have ever been beat up by the enemy, look, that was then. It's in the past. This, this is now. And um, here's, here's the theme verse that I hope you will commit to memory over the next four weeks. I want you to stand with me. And as this little video flashes across the screen, I want you to say it with me. Go right ahead, you guys. Let's say 2 Corinthians 5, 17, out loud. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Everybody say, the new is here. Give a high five to your neighbor and stretch out and then God bless you, you can have a seat. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. That was then, this is now. In these weeks, we're focusing on the redemptive grace available to us through Jesus Christ. You know, there are a lot of people who feel beat up by their past. They just have been pummel rolled by the enemy with haunting memories. But the Bible is clear of this fact. Anyone who is in Christ Jesus can experience the reality of newness. Amen. Anyone. Amen. The old has gone. Yes. The new has come. So I hope you let go of painful pasts. I have been praying that for every one of you in the room. I hope you let go of painful pasts. I have been praying this way. You have, listen, you have got to be here two weeks from today. In that message, when I talk about how to deal with temptation, if you have to miss, don't let it be that day. I believe it's one of the most important messages you may hear in your life. How do you deal with temptation? But today's sermon is titled, A New Wardrobe. You get a new wardrobe. Somebody say, yay. Yeah. Today let's look at an important scripture written by the Apostle Paul. It's Colossians chapter 3. And this is the last part of verse number 9 and then verse 10. It says, you have taken off your old self with its practices. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Did you catch that? You've taken off your old self and you have put on the new self. Just like you have stepped into God's changing room and you have a brand new wardrobe. I had to change my wardrobe a couple of years back. We made a trip to Texas at Christmas time. Yours truly decided that I would strap the suitcases on top of the car. And um, it worked fine on the way there. I'm not sure what I did on the way back. I, would, I could have used Eli telling me how to tie a knot. I know that. I know that much. Man, my suitcase flew off the top of the car. We never found it. I was just glad it was my suitcase. I was glad it wasn't my honey's suitcase. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> of, of the four suitcases up there, mine was the one that whoosh, flew off. And we drove back five miles looking and never, never found it. The only way we noticed it was gone. We didn't hear a thing. A person drove up next to us and they were waving frantically. And I thought, wow, how friendly. <laughs> I realized, oh, they're not, they're not just waving. They're trying to tell us something. And... Um, yeah, it was pretty bad because um, I had a favorite shirt that I just, I loved that shirt. It was such a nice shirt. And I wore that shirt all the time. And Stephanie told me, I am so glad that old tacky thing is gone. <laughs> she said, Keith, that shirt was 15 years old. I said, sweetie, it was just getting broke in good. I, it was so comfortable. It just fell in all the right places. But... I know what it's like to get a new, a new wardrobe. Now, for a moment, let's look, look back just a bit and take in an important verse from the very first opening of, of this book. It's Colossians chapter 1, and it's on the screen here. It's the first verses of the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. 
He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Notice what he said there. A very important point. In Christ, in Colossae. Um, some, in fact, actually a lot of the modern translations choose to say it differently because they think, well, he, he shouldn't have repeated himself with that word in, in Christ, in Colossae. And so you will read things like, in Christ at Colossae, or with Christ in Colossae. Because you know how we like for things to flow, and we like for the grammar to sound smooth, but the InterVarsity Press commentary says, no, this is actually a very important point that Paul's trying to make. It is in Christ in Colossae. And I want you to notice how I'm pointing. In Christ in Colossae. In, that is to say, in our relationship with our Lord, but also in relationship with our brothers and sisters. In the vertical relationship that Jesus has made possible by His cross, but also in the horizontal relationship that He has made possible for us. In Christ, in Colossae. Here's something important to know. Colossians is about community. Colossians is about community. You know, we believe, here's what we believe, and it's correct to believe this way, we believe that individuals are saved one at a time. Not that all of us get saved as a group, or that we all slip as a group, but we believe that each individual will stand before Jesus, and each one of us has to stand before God. And it's right to think this way. Um, you don't have to worry, for instance, if a brother in the church has an erroneous belief, you don't get held accountable for that, although it might have impact on you. But let's say that, that there's a brother who, he's just wrong. I mean, this would be bizarre, but he just, he sees nothing wrong with adultery, for instance. Well, you don't get held responsible for him. You serve the Lord in your own, uh, in your own walk with him. Well, that's good news. However, However, in America, we are so individualized. We live our lives in these isolation compartments. And, and we think that what I experience is for me, and what he experiences is for him, but that's just not the language of the Bible. In fact, most of the Bible is written in the context of community, and we don't have a plural word for you that's different from a singular word for you in English. But they did in Hebrew, and they did in Greek, and very often it's plural you. Let me help you with some Texan. It's y'all. It's all y'all. It's very seldom you. Or if you want to go back east for a moment, the Bible speaks to all you skies. Very seldom is it you or you. It's all of us. But in America, we've got these compartments. And we've got one compartment marked church and one marked home. And we've got one marked work. And then we've got this other little box called playtime. And then we've got a box called family. We've got a compartment called friends and another one called strangers. So here's what that looks like. I come to church. I go home. I read my Bible. I pray. I give my tithes. I do a part of ministry at the church. I've got something that I do that I, can, I contribute to the church. But I can be guilty of thinking, you know, so-and-so really gets on my nerves. Did that hit a little too close? Because if we allow ourselves to drift into that thinking, we have just defeated the entire part of Jesus coming because it is in Christ, it is in Colossae. It is crucial 
to realize that Colossians is about community. The book of Colossians is in particular, in particular about community. Because you see, Colossians is written to help the community of believers grow collectively in their work and in their walk, in their existence with God. It, it's a present tense book. Here's what Bible scholars are amazed at. It has a lot of prepositional phrases in it. You know, ing words. Words that indicate ongoing action right now. Very rarely do you see it speaking in past tense. Colossians is about us and what we are currently right now doing. So, Colossians. It's all about how we live as a, a local church body in our community, in our town, and how we're going to affect positive change with good outcomes. That's Colossians. In Christ, in Colossae. Or you could say it another way. In Adonai, in Arizona. You see where I'm going? In faith. In Phoenix. In belief. In Baca. See, that's Colossians. It is about what we are doing here and now. And so, when you get to chapter 3, um, it's, it's all about... That was then, and this is now. Colossians 3, verse 1, it gets into this idea of, hey, that was then, but this, this is now. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. See that? You were raised with Christ. You are seated in Christ. You died. Your life now is hidden in God. That was then. You died. This is now. Your life is now hidden in Christ with God. But He doesn't want us to be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. Because a lot of chapter 3 and 4 is how to live in community. How to get along as we're serving Jesus and moving forward. So re remember, we opened by reading verse 9, which is, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Since, that was then, this is now, right? Since you have taken off the old self. Don't. Don't lie to each other. Now, here's, here's a good question. Here's a great question. What do I need to be stripped of? As we're approaching God's changing room, as, as we're coming into a new wardrobe, well, what are the things that, that we need to just be stripped away from us? Because see, in verse number 9, when it reads, since you have taken off it's the Greek word that literally has to do with circumcision. That type of stripping away of the flesh. That word just took on a whole new painful meaning for about half of our audience. <laughs> well, what do I need to be stripped of? Well, Paul, he gives us a list of all of these things that just simply have to go. I mean, he says... It just has to go. And how good is this? It's verses 5 through 10. It's a laundry list of things that we need to be stripped of. It says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. Look at that, verse 7. That was then, right? You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Verse 8. But now, this is now, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as, as these anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Paul just says all of that stuff's got to go. It's, you just got to strip it off. It goes away. You are not to wear that anymore. Colossians 3 is about going into God's changing room. And, and many versions have a subheading for chapter 3 that, that reads something like this. Um, putting on the new self. Something about the new you. I mean, this is the extreme makeover. This is the new you. This is a new look. And now notice verse 11, what it does. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. See, because Colossians is about community. Here there is no Jew or Gentile or barbarian or slave or free, uncircumcised. Here there is no old school or new style. Here there is no blacks or whites or Hispanics or Native Americans or Asians. Here there is no poor or no rich, but Christ is all and is in all. So here's another question then. What do I need to add to my wardrobe? If, if I'm going to strip some things off, in other words, there's parts of me that have to go, no more hatred, no more discord, no more sexual immorality, or no more lying, none of those things, no rage, no anger, no malice. He, he gives a long laundry list. It's got to go. It's just got to go. But then he gives us a new wardrobe. Well, we can read about it in verse number 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any one of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I love to say that when someone asks me sometimes, well, how much does God expect me to forgive them? And I say, well, a good rule of thumb is, you know how God forgave you? Go ahead and use that as your model. Amen. How much did God forgive you? Yes. Mind blown. Yes. <laughs> We've been forgiven. Verse 14, and over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is always in style. Love is the perfect accessory. Love never disappoints. So he, he's saying, whatever you're wearing, always wear love. Right? Yeah. And, and Paul was saying, that was then, this is now. It reminds me so much of another verse that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesians. And I want to just read it, not even really commenting on it. Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24. He says a very similar thing to the Ephesians. And, and actually, just a sidebar comment, not really so much to the church at Ephesus, because what we believe about Ephesians is that it was designed as a circular letter that went all throughout that region. So it went from church to church to church, and they exchanged it, and they practiced by these words. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to clothe yourselves 
with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you see that? Just get rid of the old self. Just put it off, take it off. Put on the new self. Be clothed by renewing your mind in the likeness of God, in the image of God. Each week of this series, I want to leave you with a what I'm calling a provocative statement. And I mean for this provocative statement to make you stop and think. I hope it resonates with you and it, it makes you just really stop and think. And this is it for this Sunday. The cross is my selfie stick. It's time for a new self. Don't answer if you're under 50. Oh, over 50. What is that? It's a, um, it's a pointer that they used to use for the weatherman. Right? Pointed. It's, it's actually a cane. Oh, we got some cool 50 pluses in this room. Everybody knows it's a selfie stick. I know you guys use them. And selfie, you know, selfies are like it's, I don't know what to make of them really. <laughs> it, they're fascinating to me. I, sometimes I think, wow, why are we so fascinated with ourselves? We're going around, click, 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 you're just taking everybody from the president to the baseball stars, everybody's doing their <laughs> selfies, you know. But I, I'm doing selfies too, so I'm not, I'm not bashing on those guys, I'm just saying. That it's, I think that history will look back at the 20 teens and realize that was the decade, the invention of the selfie stick. No, I um, I, I'm holding my son's selfie stick. I don't have one, and, and Nick didn't buy it. But here's what happened: uh, Southeastern University. You know, there's, when you go to General Council, there's all of these booths. You've seen these conventions where there's booths everywhere. They want you to come and visit. And at SEU, man, they're trying to attract college students. So I thought that is the coolest idea ever. They said, if you mention us in your post and you get 50 likes, then you get a free selfie stick. Uh, I mean, for Nick, that was like nothing. He's got like 10,000 followers on Instagram. So... <laughs> So he's like, yeah, I'm all about that. He, he took a selfie and a couple minutes later he went over and picked up his selfie stick. It's, it's pretty cool. Now, um, I'm actually going to load this thing up. I'm going to do a selfie in front of you. But, but while I'm getting it loaded, because I am a quadragenarian, and I'm almost 50, but I'm still a quadragenarian, it took me a little bit of time to figure out how to use the selfie stick. And um, I don't know, Pete, do we think those pictures are going to work? We're going to try it. We're going to try to, to show you just a very brief, go ahead, Mary, let's see if it'll work or not. Show you a very brief uh, example of me learning how to use the selfie stick. <laughs> Demonstrate. Here's what I mean by that. The cross is where self dies. And the cross is my selfie stick. 
I, I'm not against culture and stuff. I, I kind of enjoy these kinds of toys. They're fun. But I think what really needs to happen is for us to not have image of self so much, but to image what it was like for our Lord dying on that cross. That stick changed humanity forever, for all of eternity. The cross is my selfie stick. And so this morning, I'm going to take a selfie with the cross. I kind of feel like, I don't know, Dracula or something. And I, I'm asking those of you that do selfies to, to come up and use the cross after service and use these hashtags. The, the cross is my selfie. It's time for a new self, Colossians 3.10. Use those and post them on social media. And let's make a statement. Let's make a statement about how valuable the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is. And that's where the new self begins. Here's how I want to close the service today. Um, I want to our worship team. You guys come on back up. And I want to pray for all of you. I mean, the whole kit and caboodle, just every one of you. I just want to pray over you. Here's what I'm picturing. You know, I wanted to make an appeal and sort of say it this way, to, to kind of say, I wonder if any of you here ever get beat up about your past. And then I thought, what a dumb question. Who doesn't? Who, who has never had the enemy come and say, oh, you're not worthy. You're no good. You know, you're a fake. You're, you're just a, a bozo. You're not really serving God. Boy, I'm going to expose you for what you really are, your true colors. When you are most vulnerable, the enemy, he'll try to pull that on you. He'll try to beat you up. I love what Carmen said decades ago. I haven't quoted this in at least 10 years, but it's a fabulous quote. When the devil tries to remind me of who I used to be, and he reminds me of my past, I just remind him of his future. Amen. Look, he is going to be cast away from the presence of God forever and ever and ever, and we are not going to be tempted or tormented, and you do not have to live in torment here and now. You are the precious child of God. So today, I'm saying to you, it's time for a new self. And so everybody that wants to experience just the peace of Christ, to just wash over you like a river, hey, I'm not going to lay hands on you, but we're just going to worship for a, a few moments, just the music playing and just praying before we leave. I would like to invite all of you to just stand up in the entire congregation. Would you just come down to the front, facing this way, and, and just simply...